Welcome to the fourth lecture of Mechanics of Materials. So far we have talked about two basic elements in Mechanics of Materials which are stress and strain. Again, we have learned that stress is intensity of internal force, strain is intensity of internal deformation, and we have learned what's the relation between these two parameters. We call that mechanical properties. We have learned that stress and strain are related together using the Hooke's law by two parameters, modular elasticity and modular rigidity. Modular elasticity or E relates normal stress to normal strain, and modular rigidity or G relates shear stress to shear strain. Also, we introduce a parameter which is called Poisson ratio that actually relates the strain in the longitudinal direction to the strain in the lateral direction. <coughs> Today, I will introduce the first application of these parameters in the real engineering world. We call them axially loaded elements. These are basically elements which are subjected to axial force. We may see many applications in the real world, like our legs. These are axially loaded elements. The weight goes all the way down through two legs. Or in buildings, you might see columns. These columns are responsible for transferring the loads to the foundation. These are axially loaded elements. Or sometimes there are more complicated structures which are under tension or compression and form a system that we call them trusses. So these are examples of axially loaded elements. Today we will learn how to determine deformation and stresses in these elements. Stress equation is the same as we have learned before, so there is no new equation. But for deformation, we will introduce one new equation, and we will use that to solve different problems. Also, we will introduce the design concept, which is a very important concept in many, many engineering majors. So that is outline of what we want to talk about today. Before talking about the axially loaded element, let me review one principle. One thing that we may already know about that, but we want to review that and make sure everybody knows that. That is what we call the principle of superposition. What does it mean? The principle of superposition says the net response at a given point caused by two or more loading is the sum of the responses which would have been caused by each force individually. So what are these responses? That might be internal force, that might be stress, strain, <coughs> deformation, or whatever. This principle says that if I have a structure like this, which is subjected to two loads, I can split that into two parts, like this and this, and then study the effect of P1 in the first structure, and study the effect of P2 in the second structure, and then simply add the response together to come up with the overall response in the original structure. This is what we call the principle of superposition. To use this principle, there are two criteria that should be met. First, linearity, which means that the material should be linear. Do you remember what is linear, by the way? In the stress strain curve, if we remain in the first region of that curve, which is linear, which is elastic region, we call the material linear. It means that stress and strain are proportional together. We learned that in mechanics of materials, we always assume materials are linear. We don't pass the yield point. So the first criteria is always met in the mechanics of materials. The second criteria is small deformation. It says, the loading must not significantly change the original geometry or configuration of this structure. And that's the case, again, in mechanics of materials. I'm not applying very, very high load, which causes failure or damage in the structure. So loading are within the capacity of the structure. And in that capacity, the deformations are small compared to the dimension of the structure. So these two criteria are always satisfied in mechanics of materials. So I can always use principle of superpositions, superposition in the mechanics of material. All right. Now, let me introduce the deformation equation in the axially loaded element. 
as we discussed, axially loaded element is an element which is subjected to axial force, like the one that you see in this figure. So consider one element subjected to one force. How we can determine deformation in this bar? We have learned equations to determine that. I want to combine this equation and come up with one single equation that enables me to determine deformation in that bar. Okay, how much stress in that element? Stress is force over area. Okay, let me write it. Stress is F over A. How much is strain in that element? Strain is, using the Hooke's law, strain is stress over modulus of elasticity. That is the Hooke's law. If I replace stress from the top equation to this one, I will get F over EA. How much is deformation if we know the strain in the element? Deformation is strain times length. So that is epsilon times L. And again, if I replace epsilon from the second equation to the third one, I will get this one, FL over EA. So that's the only equation that I want to introduce in the axially loaded element. Let me consider another case. Consider a case where there are different elements connecting together, like this one. In this case, there are two elements which are subjected to three loads, P1, P2, and P3. I want to see how much is the total deformation in that system. How can I determine that? Use the concept that we just talked about, and that is principle of superposition. So I'm going to split that structure into simpler parts, determine the response, which in this case is deformation, in each part separately, and then add them up together to determine how much is the total response in the system. Does that make sense? All right, so let's consider the first part, which I call that element number one. I can determine how much is change in the length in that element, either shortening or elongation. Let's call that delta one. Similarly, we can determine the deflection or deformation in the second part. Let's call that delta two. And we can determine the same parameter in the third element. Let's call that delta three. How much is the total deformation in that system? The principle of superposition says that we need to add them together. So delta 1, delta 2, and delta 3. Okay? So delta is delta 1 plus delta 2 plus delta 3. This is what we call the deformation in a system of axially loaded elements connected together. And let me show you the formula in this way. In this case, I simply use, I simply determine delta as some of deflection or deformation in each bar. So why is your, which one's your F2? Which force is that? Is that P2? Okay, P2? good question. It's a very important question. The question is, what is the force within each element? F2, F1, or F, say, 3? Is it equal to P1, P2, and P3? Remember? The way to determine internal force is always using freeway diagram. Please do not save time by guessing what is the internal force in the element. Separate that, cut the element, put unknown force, apply the external force, use some, some of the equi use equilibrium equation to determine how much is that internal force. So that's the way we can determine the internal force in the element. So in this case, it is not P1, it is not P2, it is not P3, it's a combination of them in element number two. Okay, so I will solve the problem to see how we can determine internal force in that element. But this is a very important question. All right. The last case that I want to talk about is the axially loaded element with variable section or variable loading, like this. In this case, the area is not constant along the length of beam. It's varying. The same is true for internal force. The force is not constant along the length of beam. It is variable along that. How we can determine total change in the length of such beam? To do that, we need to do some sort of mathematical operations, which we call that integration. Let's see what we can do here. Let me consider small part of that. I want to take out that small part 
and see how much is deformation in that tiny small part in the middle. So I'm going to take it out. I will use a free body diagram to determine how much is the internal force in that tiny part. I want to determine the deformation in that part. Because the length of that part is very small, I assume that the area is constant along that small uh, length. Okay, that's just a, an assumption. All right. So how can I determine the change in the length of that element? In this case, I can use the equation that I had before because now the area is constant, the force is constant. So I will write down delta or d delta, d here stands for a very small value, is equal to force, which in this case is p x. p x means p as a function of x. How much is the length of the element? The length of the tiny part is dx. The area is a, a function of x, and modulus of elasticity is e. So the change in the length of that tiny element would be px dx divided by e a x. OK. How much would be the deformation of the entire length of that beam? I need to split that structure into very many, many slices and then determine the deformation in each part and then add them together. So mathematically, I can say delta <coughs> is equal to sum of infinite number of pieces, which means sum of 0 to infinity of d delta, and sum of infinite number of small pieces mathematically means integral. So I can replace that with integral. I will say integral from 0 to L. It means that the integral for the entire length of the, that element. And if I plug the value into that equation, I will get this integral form. So deformation in the variable section or the variable force is this one. This is integral form. And we have to use that to determine how much is the total change in the length of axially loaded element with the variable section or with the variable loading. OK, now let me summarize what we have learned so far. In simple axial element, like the one that we discussed at the beginning, like this, we determine the axial deformation from this equation, FL over EA. If we have a system of rods connected together, we simply add the deformation in each rod uh, together to determine the overall deformation. And in the section, in the rod with the variable section or the variable loading, we have to use the integral form. So depending on what is our case, we will use one of these three equations. And note that all these three equations are kind of equivalent to each other. The simplest form is the top one. A bit more complicated is the middle one, and the general form is the bottom one. Okay, what is the sign convention? The sign convention fortunately follows what we have learned so far. Do you remember what was the sign convention for force? Tension positive, compression negative. What is the sign convention for strain? Elongation, which is caused by tension, is positive. Compression is negative. The same is true for deformation. So here, elongation that is caused by tension is assumed to be positive. A shortening which is caused by compression is assumed to be negative. Note that it doesn't matter what, where, what is the direction of that elongation. In this case, the elongation goes to the right, and in this figure, elongation goes to the left. But in both cases, because the change in the leg length is elongation, I would call that as positive deflection. Now let me solve a problem. 